Today, uh, 20, 22nd of April, is uh, International Earth Day, a date to stress the importance of caring and preserving the environment. On the occasion of this day, GMB celebrates this seminar about how satellite information supports restoring our damaged Earth. And uh, now I introduce you to today's speaker. Firstly, Julia Yahweh, uh, who is Senior Sustainable Forest Project Manager. Secondly, Beatriz Revilla, who is Natural Hazards and Disaster Risk Reduction Project Manager. And uh, last but not least, Carlos Domenech, who is Senior Manager Climate Change and Sustainable Services. They all work in the Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analytics Division at GMB. Um, welcome to all of you. And uh, now, Beatriz, is your turn. I give you the floor. Hi, Beatriz. Hi, hi everyone. One second. Oh, I would like to sorry share a screen to uh, can you see now my presentation, Tatiana? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So thank you everyone. As Tatiana said, today is Thursday, 2021, and we like to um to show you how uh, satellite information in uh, different topics can support restoring um, our damage. And um, um, based on this, I'm very much related to what we are trying to raise awareness uh, today uh, is related to the sustainable development goals. And earth observation in general and your special information has many links to these goals, targets, and indicators. And we'll show you today a few examples. So, um, uh, the first uh, blog today is related to the Earth Challenge. Um, and with the uh, environmental threats of uh, extreme climate change or water and air pollution can feel overwhelming. And in fact, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the interconnections of the world and how we need to prepare our people and the planet uh, for those socio socioeconomics and environmental risks which are very much related. Our science uh, provides evidence-based support uh, decisions and upholds the common good. And it's here where uh, satellite uh, information and especially this innovation behind can uh, help. So I don't want to go too much into detail, but I think it's quite important to set up some uh, basic concepts. So a hazard, for example, can be defined as a dangerous phenomenon or human activity or condition that cause a loss of life, injury, property damage, or environmental damage, for example. And a category of the hazards are natural hazards. In fact, there are several subcategories, and today we will show you just few examples related to the meteorological and the hydrogen hazards, for example, for floods and droughts. But we, with air observation, also at GMB, we also work in other topics, for example, like forest fires, or uh, earthquakes and, and landslide related to your hazards. Um, so to, to set the scene here with some examples and some numbers, um, disaster events in numbers are recorded by the MDA database that for many years with a specific criteria has been, um, has been uh, recording events. Um, sorry, Tatani, I think we can hear your mic. And, on the background, or maybe some of my colleagues. Um, so uh, here, that's fine. Um, so uh, here we have we can see by the numbers that floods uh, are really like the, the the disaster type with higher number, following by storms and, for example, droughts that perhaps they don't have that many uh, type of events recorded, although they can be also more challenged to be recorded. However, when we look into the number of people affected by floods, you, uh, sorry, by, by disaster type, we can see that clearly floods are those that has a major affection on the population, following by droughts and then third one um, storms. 
And, and before we go into how satellite data can actually help, um, I would like to uh, remember that flooding is a natural phenomenon and that humans have coped with since the start of the first settlements. In fact, many of our towns and cities are located near rivers and we have lived with them. Um, however, in re and in fact, in regions with uh, extra seasonal rainfall patterns, uh, the, the floods has often become an integral part of the agriculture because it has many benefits. But when these events become extreme or hit locations with high vulnerability, especially, for example, if we are uh, building uh, houses on floodplains, for example, then is when floods can uh, be life threatening and also devastating. And it has demonstrated that the floods events will not only have an impact at the local level, but also at the national and even international level, for example, by disrupting uh, supply chains. So how satellite data can help in all this? If we look at the different at the four uh, different phases of the disaster risk management cycle or the emergency management cycle, which are preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation, we can see that satellite data at different times of the cycle can in fact um, uh, help to assess or monitor some of these uh, situations related to, to forest fires or floods or earthquakes, for example. And uh, our colleagues in Portugal, in fact, they were for the Copernicus Emerg Emergency Management System, uh, Service, where whenever there's an activation by a member country or, or another, um, or the European Commission itself, can, uh, um, so when there's an activation, for example, for floods, uh, they can do a rapid mapping of floods. So how this happened, how this uh, occurs is that, uh, for example, satellite sentinel, for example, will pass over an area uh, where it has been flooded, and then with the algorithm, they will be able to automatically kind of delineate uh, this uh, floods uh, flood map. And so once you have that, then you can go into do a bit more advanced uh, damage assessment maps using photo interpretation, for example, to support to assess the level of the damage suffered by different infrastructures such as roads, buildings, for example, an airport or a hospital. And now moving from the other extreme or hydraulic extremes from floods, we move now into droughts. And droughts are a recurrent feature of the climate that results, for example, for a shortfall in precipitation over extended periods, or the inadequate timing of that lack of rainfall can affect uh, the uh, needs of the vegetation cover. But it can also be triggered because a negative balance in the water, uh, water sorry, negative water balance due to uh, increase on potential evapotranspiration. And due to high temperatures. And as there are different types of droughts, we also need different types of data to assess or monitor these situations. I would like to highlight that droughts are not only something relevant to, for example, hot countries. In fact, if we look at these maps for the European Commission uh, for the droughts uh, severities in Europe, we see that not only those countries in, in uh, for example, in the Mediterranean region are affected by floods uh, or by droughts. Many of those countries are also, for example, in Central Europe. And if you might be aware with the with the news, uh, the past summers there's been quite significant droughts in, for example, the Netherlands and Germany causing new situations for and uh, challenges for, for example, for agriculture or for um, the economy in the areas. If we now move into a continent that we perhaps we are more aware of uh, the impacts of, of droughts in, in the population, uh, it's, it's in Africa. And we have uh, several projects working there. And one example here that we like to highlight is in the Horn of Africa, where they have a number of droughts. And for example, in Somalia, the 2016-2017 drought was quite prolonged and destroyed livelihoods and displaced almost one million of Somalis. 
and it's the combination now not only of the, the these uh, severe climate conditions but it's the combination with other factors uh, such as for example that cause humanitarian crisis for example with the conflicts that has put Somalia into a major um, humanitarian emergency and it's in fact in this country where we are working and uh, our colleagues are working to develop an earth observation based products to monitor the impacts of droughts but on environmental migration in this country and as in this case they focus on agricultural droughts they are using several indicators uh, to to monitor for that 2016-2017 uh, period how this uh, Earth observation will have helped to uh, monitor the different levels of uh, drought in this area. And with this, I'll finish the first uh, section of today's webinar. I'll pass it to the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Let's turn to let's turn off Carlos. Carlos, I give you the floor. Okay, I was muted. Sorry. I think you can see my my screen clearly. Hopefully. Uh, well, it, this is not the presentation layout. Yeah, you have to. to do you hear me, Carlos? Yes. Are you not? Are you looking at the? So are you? You can. Cannot you see the presentation in the in the cord mode? Should I change it? No. 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 no you have to switch to presentation mode. Uh, that's that's the way. Yeah. Okay. One sec. It's because. Sorry. One sec. Yeah, it's because by default, um, yeah, um, it should be okay now. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Well, um, sorry for this. Um, well, for this small break, uh, I will be showing today a couple of, of presentations, a couple of discussions, and I will first start with um, uh, with with a couple of examples that I will show of things that we are doing at GMV on on the wetland, wetland monitoring. Basically, what we do is just to um, collaborate with some international entities, you know, international financial institutions, in order just to come up with solutions for them just to uh, be able to analyze the places in which the wetlands should be restored or rehabilitated, or in any case, they are targeted for interventions. So let's start then. Okay, so with Earth observation, uh, you can monitor uh, the wetland degradation, that is the, the extent and the health, on a national coverage, as well as uh, evaluating the impact of each type of uh, rehabilitation intervention. This is important because it's indeed helping a lot the, the institutions we work with in order for them just to be able just to uh, prioritize their their projects. So measurements that you can obtain from satellite includes uh, lake level, water extent and quality, water uh, has signed invasion, that is one of the um, intruded species in many lakes. And of course, uh, land use land cover changes and uh, biodiversity trends, among others. Uh, to understand how productive cancer are in delivering water and how this productivity has changed over time, it's of great interest for the local authorities because uh, this information helps inform decision makers on the wetland status and trends, types of impacts that may affect populated areas, and how much risk is being avoided by rehabilitating uh, the wetlands. So the Naibugoko catchment in Rwanda is the country most densely populated catchment with uh, near 1.4 million inhabitants. Its wetlands suffer from significant degradation of land, vegetation, and water resources due to increasing occupation of industries, intrusive agriculture, and of course, housing areas. Raising temperatures and changing rainfall patterns, resulting in frequent droughts and higher intensity rains, cause additional threats to the wetlands, rivers, and catchments that feed into the Victoria. Naibugoko catchment is one of those that feed into Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is one of the major lakes in Africa that is indeed really affected by increasing uh, pollution from anthropogenic activities, and those things are exac exacerbated by the climate change. 
So, in in partnership with the with the with the World Bank and with the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, uh, GMV supported the environmental management plans for the Lake Victoria Basin with the monitoring of the lake's shoreline and the analysis of the introduced species. What was mentioned before, the has signed, the water has signed, uh, inviting its waters. So the lake, the Lake Victoria, uh, fuels the economies of uh, of many countries, of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and others. And the analytic study that we carried out with the, with the bank shown that its resources are seriously compromised. What you see here in the in the left, it's a it's a picture, a comparison of uh, different timestamps in the 1994 and 2019 of the environmental changes in the in the mouth of the Nile River, that is in, in the Victoria, and we selected this uh, false color composition to emphasize the changes in vegetation. You can of course see in the, the plants cover land uh, and water in, in red, and um, and you can also see you can distinguish the different lines that are giving the the soil line evolution for the from the 85 to to 2019 and uh, you can see how the, the the water has been disappearing over over the over the time now and i will also show another example also in africa but in this case in in lesotho lesotho um, it's a landlocked country within south africa and well endowed with wetlands of marine types um, it's, it's worth noting that the healthy wetland ecosystems have several functions, including carbon cycling, food uh, flood protection, erosion reduction, and play a large role in water purification, particularly in urban and agricultural areas. Lesotho depends on its water resources to create revenue for the country. Economically, it relies heavily on the foreign change of its water supply in order to stay financially stable. So wetlands are very important for the country. And of course, they need to, to know and to understand which is the status and if the, the condition of the wetlands are, is, not, is not perfect, then we'll need to in, invest resources into the rehabilitation or restoration. In that context, IFAT, that IFAT is the International Fund for, for Agricultural Development, executes uh, a project to ensure that real communities in Lesotho adopt transformational practices for regenerated landscapes and sustainable livelihoods. Our, our role, GV tasks, included to catalog wetlands and to respond to how productive the Lesotho's catchment in delivering water are and how has that changed over the time. That is, how wetlands are changing, likely uh, degrading over time. What you see here in this in this uh, in this map is basically uh, what uh, we did to 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 monitor the, the wetlands. So we analyze uh, 10 meters satellite images, and over 2017 and 2019 to obtain the the different um, uh, wetland station uh, and how resilient the, the wetlands are. Um, that information. It gives you very important information because it can be also used in order to do this analysis that you see here in this slide, in which uh, we analyze uh, the weather monthly and uh, the weather extent was structured for the 70, uh, 74 subcatchments in Sile Soto in order to analyze the weather changes. Which you see here an, an example of one of the catchments, or well, in this case, subcatchments that uh, were identified with this circle in the in the in the map, in the left you see the the precipitation and the and the wetland extent, and you see that from the um, yearly cycle that you see in 2017 that is increasing in in December, uh, just following the pattern of the precipitation, with the in 2018 and 2019 the the pattern of the precipitation was not followed anymore and it was a decay in the extent of the wetlands. So this kind of analysis was uh, applied for the whole catchments, just analyzing first or, or detecting first the, the, the wetland areas within the catchment and then um, creating this kind of plot just to analyze the, the, the evolution of the changes and um, applying some techniques. We come up with um, this map that provides uh, for the, the government 
and for the for IFAD and an idea of with the time how those um, wetland areas has been changing. And this is the last slide of my first presentation, so I would like just to move to the okay. next speaker. Yes, Julia, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Sorry, I'm not sure if I've I activated my camera. No, mm -hmm. we can see you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So, so happy to be with you all uh, celebrating this Earth Day and with the opportunity of showing you uh, all the things or many of the things we do at, at GMB in support of this Earth restoration. And I will focus on uh, sustainable forest management, an area which is uh, key to, to environmental um, balance and we do lots of things for, for it. So first of all, just to, to come in, into the subject, the subject of forest, of forest management, uh, which uh, I'm quite sure that I'm talking to um, a group of people that we are more accustomed to living in cities than living out uh, in the country and in the midst of the forest. So sometimes we tend to look at forest as something picturesque, but uh, we don't live it on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have to approach this topic uh, very professionally and with respect. So the 31% 30, of the global land is covered by forest. And the five most forested countries in the world, which are uh, China, the Russian Federation, Canada, the US, and Brazil, uh, they, they cover uh, most of the biomass uh, volume. How forests uh, give house to most terrestrial biodiversity, and of course they are source, as we just saw with our colleagues uh, Beatriz and, and Carlos, they are the source of water, livelihoods, uh, climate balance, um, they act as um, carbon sinks, etc. Now the point here is uh, the result of the equation. Uh, is there more regeneration or more degradation of forest? Okay, we will come to see some some samples, but not everything is wrong, not everything is right. So that's why I put it into an equation. Uh, there are some, some areas in the world uh, where forests experience a loss, uh, whereas in some areas, we will see in Europe, we have a win. Uh, again, uh, forests, uh, we have to see, see them as well uh, as a primary source even as a business, of course, um, forests provide more than 86 million green jobs throughout the world, three in Europe, and many people live and are able to cook and heat themselves thanks to fuel wood, and that accounts for over 800 million people. So when we are in our urban city houses and we have central heating uh, that's very comfortable but we have to keep into consideration the, that many around the world need to rely on forest wood and of course uh, of those people living in extreme poverty 90 percent of them they they are able to to reach out day in and day out, thanks to the livelihood provided by, by forests. Now, what's the situation in, in Europe? So we have 35% of our land, land area covered by forests. And as I say before, this is with an increasing tendency. Why? Basically because uh, we are abandoning our fields. Sometimes we are abandoning agriculture, but also we are abandoning uh, forests. Um, 
and part of that abandoned agriculture fields uh, turn up and, and evolve towards uh, forests. Uh, again, uh, we have 16 million private owners throughout Europe, which accounts for 500 billion turnover in economy, uh, with more than 3 million people employed in the sector. Mm, again, forests can be seen from the perspective of economy, but also uh, from ecosystem services to keep our waters clean, our mm, our, the quality of, of our air, uh, to prevent floods, etc. Of course, uh, I think that most of us are very, very sensitive to, to the greenhouse effects and uh, forest capture, at least in Europe, 10% of that uh, ca carbon sink. Is there bi biodiversity loss? Yes, there is and uh, we are making our forests less and less resilient to, to pests and, and to biodiversity. Sometimes it's because they are too much fragmented, so we just have small pockets here and there, but they are not well connected, so um, they will end up a kind of being so, so along and so badly related with other pockets that they, they will mm, degrade and die away. So the ecosystem's health is an issue in, in Europe, also uh, because of the invasive uh, alien species, both vegetal and, and animal. And we observe that there are some uh, changing weather patterns. Uh, by that, I mean that we are experiencing warmer, drier, and larger summers. Uh, I will show you the consequences in a minute. And we have drastic changing forest fire patterns. All in, overall, we have nearly half a million hectares burned down every year. Uh, but the problem is that regions that had never before in our historical records experience what we call mega fires or uh, wildfires, uh, they are experiencing them now in Finland, in Norway, in northern Germany, etc. So the problem is there. And be before I, I come to show you what we do through satellites to to monitor and manage uh, forests wisely, I would like to introduce you to something that um, we have to be conscious of, and which is the, the forest life cycle and the silvicultural cycle. So what's, what's done uh, along, the, along the life cycle of a, a tree, a forest, um, is always changing, but we can capture and, and take some instant photographs and, and say what to do in, in each one of the moments. So first of all, we have what we, we call the afforestation. So the, the beginning of a forest and the beginning of a forest could be planting, but the beginning of a forest or reforestation it could be after a forest fire, could be after uh, sowing and putting the wood into a sawmill and in, into the industry. So the initiation of a forest uh, could be varied. So the, our hand, the human hand and the control of satellites, not only for, for the trees, but also for, the, for soil, for water, for humidity uh, can be there. So there will be a second moment uh, when, when mm, the, the forest evolved to a, a grown up state. That, that depends on the time, depends on the on the species. Uh, we range from uh, six to 10 up to 12 years for species such, such, such as eucalypt. We go to 25 years for pinus or even up to 140 years for oaks. So the sequence is very different. So we have to know with which species uh, we are working because the needs uh, need to be ad hoc. Uh, once the, the forest is grown up, 
comes the, the time to go into products and services to harvest it. And not only to harvest it for, for wood production, but also we look, uh, we are starting to, to work with agroforestry env environments. So um, items like uh, cocoa, that um, they are semi-forestal, but they are also agricultural. So we need to provide specific solutions per stage. And in some occasions, during some periods, this will be managed or unmanaged. We will leave them. Uh, but because the cycle is it could be so long, it's not just one season, uh, as in cereals, for instance, um, we need to look at forests in a different way because they are providing lots of services. Now, uh, what uh, do satellites, uh, what satellites do for, for sustainable forest management? And this is what I would like to share, uh, what we do uh, in our division at, at GMB. Uh, we are aware of the forest service need depending on the different moment. So at the beginning, we have to characterize the, the site uh, where the, the forest plantation is going on. And for that, we will need a forest mask to know the limits uh, up until where uh, the, the forest or what we want to recover for forestry reaches out to have a cartography, to have the full data, uh, brown field data, uh, which are the main forest types. Uh, in some sometimes, unless the, there are plantations of just one single age plantations, we need to know forest age. And for that, we need to process uh, loads of multi-temporal uh, satellite data sets from even up to the 1970s with the old um, satellite families, families of, of satellites. Uh, that has led, at, led us to all these satellite products to um, automatize them. So now this list that you see here, I will not go in, into all of them, but um, they are fully automatized and dockerized so that we don't have to, um, to, to work in such unique uh, approach. And um, now it takes us uh, a lot less time to, to be able to, to provide uh, all, these, all these products. So then, as you can see, uh, there are some products for that, that forest site characterization. We have also developed algorithms for forest condition to detect some biotic damages, I'll show you in a minute. But also uh, we are working for um, something that, um, an aspect that of the forest that is coming very pushy into the markets as it is uh, biomass and carbon stocks. The carbon stocks markets are moving uh, billions, billions around the world. Of course, ecosystem vulnerabilities, as uh, Beatriz already mentioned, and we are coming into commodities, uh, already working with cocoa classifications, of course, deforestation and agricultural droughts. And now I just show you, I wanted to share with you uh, a sample of this biotic damage uh, control with satellites, which is the using Sentinel-2 satellites, the case of the uh, bark beetle infestation, which is very severe, in Europe, because uh, we, uh, we are housed here in, in Europe, but not only, also in Canada, China. So it, this is a real pest. Mm, there you have a, like aerial view, an aerial view on, on the appearance uh, on how it really kills out the, the, the spruce, the trees, and a close uh, photograph on how this mm, little worm uh, eats away uh, with lots, of, lots of mm, inner bark channels, uh, eats away the the tree, and then dries out and and dies. And all this is just in one season, from one year to the next, uh, thousands of hectares are die away, and in the um, chart below, uh, we give you the, the sample of, on, 
on the impact in the Czech Republic, uh, a point where we are studying with some colleagues since three years ago, colleagues from, from Breno University. And there you can see how the, the impact is being exponential. So that's the problem. So what do we do uh, with all these uh, products that we sh show you before? We uh, just download uh, or yeah, access uh, all the multi-temporal um, satellite data sets that, that we have to produce the forest non-forest to see uh, the limits of the, the what we are um, uh, looking at and, and then uh, we mask the territories that we are not interested in also to, to save efforts and then uh, we classified it by the dominant tree species in this case we know that the spruce um, trees are the, the ones most affected and from there also we have to analyze the water content the leaf area index the phot photosynthetic activity and uh, well to come also to these uh, um, biological algorithms to see which are the key components and drivers uh, that um, um, speak uh, and, and yeah let us know that the plague of, of bar beetle is affecting uh, the trees and by the end the the outputs um, show us the spruce, spruce uh, vitality uh, with a, a range and there we are able to differentiate uh, areas which have no damage or minor, moderate or severe damage. We have uh, validated this on the field in the Czech Republic but not only, not only there and uh, is so striking the I mean, the results and the, the effect that uh, there in Central Europe, all cent throughout Central Europe, this uh, plague, this biotic damage has changed the, the price of wood into the market, has uh, caused lots of unemployment of people who, who for years and years and generations have been working out in the forests. Now they have no wood to, or, uh, to take the infested wood out of the, the forest is, is so expensive that they just leave it to die away in the forest itself. And then it comes a cascading effect of the second problem, which is forest fires. And now that's what we are um, providing services for as well. So as you can see, and well, here is just a, a matrix uh, of the, the area we are uh, looking at uh, to position uh, the severity and the location of the trees that are affected or not. And with this sample, which I think is quite striking, I would like to, to pass the, the word to Beatrice. Now we move uh, again to Carlos. Oh, I to think Carlos. It's Carlos. <laughs> I'll give you the floor. Uh, thanks a lot. So hopefully you can see my screen now. And I hope yeah. I don't. Okay, but yeah. okay, that's nice. Okay, so thanks a lot, um, uh, Tatiana, and thank you, um, Julia, for giving me the floor. So now we are going to discuss one one of the remaining topics on the on the S day of this year, that is the climate literacy. Basically, we will be, uh, well, the, as you see in the title of the presentation, Assessing Racelands Regulation to Support Paris Agreement Implementation. I will uh, guide you through a few slides from the political decisions on climate to the actual mitigation and adaptation interventions. But of course, just give you some, some hints on, on this because it's very, well, very complex uh, topic and we have just a few minutes to discuss about it. So hope it's helping you to understand a bit better of this world. So the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is an international treaty on climate change adopted by 195 countries and the European Union. All those are called Paris. Um, it was in Paris in December 2015. So its goal is uh, basically is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius degrees compared to the pre-industrial levels. So under the agreement, the, the Paris to the 
uh, United Nations Framework Conventions on Climate Change have pursued policies and measures to reduce their greenhouse uh, gases emissions with the preparation and implementation of nationally determined contributions, NDCs, towards the agreement objectives. So what are NDCs? The NDCs embody efforts by each party to reduce national emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. By 2025, because these NDCs are renewed every five years, or at least uh, updated, parties are expected to produce a new round of indices, so new or updated, covering the post-2030 period. Implementing the indices. I will focus in the soil and in carbon. Of course, indices is co are covering many different topics. So in this presentation, we will focus in on the, so uh, on the SOC, on the soil organic carbon. So monitoring and reporting uh, on changes to soil organic carbon stocks is essential for policy makers in order to develop greenhouse uh, gas inventories. But not, not only on the soil or in carbon, just linking to what um, Julia presented on the biomass, on the forest. So monitoring and reporting on changes to forest carbon stocks is also essential for policy makers to be in form of trends in the forest seek evolution uh, and to analyze, uh, of course, the, also the, the contribution to the annual greenhouse gas inventories. So a, a bit on the soil carbon, so soil carbon sequestration. This is a process in which the CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and stored in the soil carbon pool. This process is primarily mediated by plants through the photosynthesis with the carbon stored in form of, uh, of the soil organic carbon. So these shock are sensitive to management and land use changes. That is grazing, species composition, mineral nutrient availability, all those can lead to losses or gains of the soil carbon, that is emission of absorption of the CO2. The shock in rangelands. Rangelands or grazing areas or pasture lands are uh, ecosystems that cover a large portion of the Earth's surface and contains a substantial amount of soil organic carbon. Mismanagement of rangelands has led to the degradation Land degradation is indeed recognized as a main environmental problem that adversely depletes soil carbon stocks, which in turn really affects soil, the fertility, productivity, and overall quality. In Central Asia, the largest uh, contiguous area of grassland in the world serves as an important source of livelihood for pastoral and agro-pastoral communities in the region. So what you see here, it's a, it's a map uh, showing uh, the soil or in carbon uh, changes over the period from 21, sorry, 20, um, 2001 to 2015, that are mapped over ancient areas. This information is obtained from satellite because indeed uh, Earth observation provides information on, on, or can provide information on, on, on pastoral degradation. So it's able just to, to analyze different variables of the reasons that assess the health condition and this assessment can be done over several decades and can focus on palatal species that are indeed the, the ones that are of interest for the, uh, the, the farming of the grazing communities. This information can be used to evaluate the impact of the regions on the depletion of the soil organic carbon stocks, allowing to predict the impact of large management on the carbon losses to the atmosphere and, of course, the associated global warming. So, which is the role of GMV on all this? So, GMV uh, collaborated with the with IFAD, that was as mentioned before, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, uh, supporting the NDC update in in Central Asia. In particular, we are working in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. This I will show here today examples of, of the of the done for the Kyrgyzstan authorities. So, James, James' role is uh, the provision of information of the, for the NDC update, that is, the preparation of the climate policies and national planning for the post-2030 period. So, following the IPCC guidelines that are the International Panel for Climate Change, GMV assesses the current degradation of regions at country level, so at the, at the whole country, compared to the situation at the end of the last century, using Earth observation. So the, those uh, outcomes, so the, the results from, from the GMV analysis, are used by the FAO, uh, greenhouse gas uh, modelers, to estimate the carbon emission and sequestration. 
And here you see an example of the results that we that we obtained for, for the colleagues from FAO, GIF, and of course the, the guys from IFAT. So this is a map of the range and condition changes over the period 2000-2020. So this, this product has been um, developed using satellite data, 30 meters, Landsat family, uh, many different uh, Landsat-based uh, indices, vegetation indices, moisture indices, bar area indices, etc. Uh, and all those are um, map over um, uh, look, uh, land use land cover map that has been optimized using artificial intelligence techniques. Uh, we, we follow, as I said before, the IPCC thresholds on, on grassland degradations and the most important thing that we um, obtain information from local um, uh, local institutions like the Kampala 2 public foundation on, uh, that provides uh, that provided us with uh, um, grazing seasonal periods with the information on the grazing altitudes the the grazing on slopes and also the the, the pastures distance to the villages in winter so we have a lot of information uh, from the local uh, local people, from the local stakeholders, that help, help us just to focus the, the analysis and to um, target the the observations on the on on the specific areas of interest and also on the specific uh, timestamps of the periods of interest. So at the end, we come up with these um, kind of maps. So at the bottom, you can see the seasonal uh, uh, parcels or so the, the the range times on the over the different seasons and and the, in the central, the central picture is a combination of all those four. So the analysis of the regional condition indicates that uh, over the 90% of the total grazing areas in Kyrgyzstan are degraded. But in, in particular, we focus on, for instance, in, in winter, that is even worse because the not 90, but the 80% of the of the grazing areas or rangelands are indeed severely degraded. All this information has been validated with the with local stakeholders and has been used for many different activities not only for the NDC update but also for the the different activities on on grazing that are being developed by by ifat in the in the country and uh, and neighborhood countries and that's my last slide so now is the is the turn of um, of yeah Second share screen two. Oh, yeah. So you can, you can see it right, the presentation. Okay. Yes. So can you see the, the presentation? Yes. Okay. okay. So, um, so with this, uh, we'll start now the final uh, section of the webinar, which is a bit like slightly different, but also it's like quite important um, uh, challenge. So, which is related to uh, marine lethal and, and specifically on, on plastic pollution. I think for probably for quite too long, uh, you know, what uh, as this picture see uh, from Ferdi uh, Kidanto, try to uh, display is that just because we can see it, it doesn't mean that it isn't there. And in fact, there's so much, uh, you know, uh, we have finally come to the relation on, and we studied the date actions of how much actually we have polluted, um, polluted the seas. So marine litter uh, resulting from spills, um, bad waste and management has now become a worldwide problem and we are pretty much aware of that. And in the fact is that half of that waste is plastic. And that's a really bad news for everyone and obviously for the oceans because plastic takes far too long to degrade. So now they have started a lot of different uh, actions and movements of, for example, trying to um, collect some of these uh, plastic uh, or, or, or marine litter uh, where these uh, hot spots of areas where uh, large amounts of, uh, of, of pollution, uh, because then also the problem when they got uh, into a smaller particles and, and then became uh, microplastics and they start with, uh, they basically go into the uh, tropic uh, cycle chain. And one of the things that is pretty much innovative is to say, well, like, can we use earth observation images 
to uh, at least like detect or monitor some of this uh, pollution in the sea. And GMB currently is working on three different projects, uh, mainly focusing on marine lithium and plastic, also others with uh, oil spills. And, and we started this uh, experience um, because we already work on detecting oil spills. And, and then um, basically based on this, we said, well, can we uh, develop part of the algorithm uh, to see even if it kind of, it is very challenging for a smaller, um, when, when the patches of, for example, plastics or marilita are very small, it's still quite challenging, for example, used to use Sentinel. They need to be above like 10 by 10 uh, square meters. And um, what well, we have started to do a uh, test, and one of those then challenges is to have sufficient uh, ground truth data to actually validate the results. Um, however, for example, by combining with other data uh, sources, uh, it helps to, to validate uh, the algorithms, uh, the results of the algorithms. So, for example, in the VWatch pro project, we're currently using uh, the output of the mathematical uh, sea currents uh, um, from the Hispanic Research Center, the CSIC, uh, to help us uh, to look at specific times and areas where plastic accumulation uh, might be helped by those currents. Um, or, for example, uh, we need to be a bit more creative. And uh, actually, I, our colleagues from the University of Vigo they installed some uh, plastic sheets with different sites and different materials at the same time that the, the Sentinel satellite was going to pass over that area. And that was done a couple of weeks ago. To then run our algorithm with that image to see whether we could actually like detect some of the plastics and depending on the uh, plastic fraction that you add into the, to the algorithm and the type you can detect what for example, one or both of those uh, sheets. But we are also like looking into a uh, different type of, uh, you know, information around the world and test cases. So for example, uh, on davistracker.org, uh, they, the, the population the citizens can record when they found, uh, for example, uh, uh, garbage on the coast. And we saw that on the Dominican Republic in the 11th of May 2019, there were a high uh, number of, of those reports. And when we ran the Sentinel image uh, with our algorithm, we saw that in fact on the coast, there was a large number of, of, of pollution on, on that area. And it's by doing these uh, like uh, exercises uh, we're doing uh, in different parts of, of the world, whenever we find some kind of uh, ground truth to actually validate or find some hotspots of plastic uh, concentration where we are currently working. And that's pretty much uh, innovative. And if you would like to find more of the technical details, uh, our colleagues are uh, Om Omiyoti is presenting next week on the EU conference uh, virtual next Thursday. So if you're attending, please uh, uh, look for him and uh, you will find out a lot more details about this. Um, and just to find uh, to finalize uh, this webinar, I think like with many of the global uh, challenges, uh, we can see that individual will soon drop, but together we are on the sea. So we're just speaking about, uh, about the sea, uh, but also we are part of the solution. And thanks to the eyes of satellites, it helped us to identify some of uh, monitor or assess better some of the current challenges and look for solutions. So thank you everyone. I think now we have a few minutes uh, for the um, uh, questions section. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Beatriz, Julia, and Carlos. Uh, so interesting and amazing. The great potential of satellite data and space technology for a climate change issue. Um, we almost reached the, the final of the session, but we have a few minutes and we open the round of questions. Um, the first question comes from Mary. Mary asks, uh, what's more efficient for forest restorations, manage or and manage interventions? Intervention, perdón. sorry. Okay, so um, I think by, by allusion, I should answer. Uh, what I would say is that, um, 
one thing is restoration, right? Uh, and to, to achieve restoration, uh, we need to act. <laughs> the, the human action and the human push and, and we need to booster that that area that we need or we want to recover. The, the dilemma comes later on. So up to when or up to what point should uh, human intervention continue or uh, we should stop and leave the forest grow to its own uh, so that also biodiversity comes in naturally, etc. In that respect, there are many, many different experiences. Uh, there are, in Central Europe, there are certain forests that have been set aside and it's forbidden to come into them um, and to have any actions and they want to present it up to uh, 100 years without any, any action whatsoever. So those are yeah we can act in that way and, and trying to recover what we call primary forests and in some areas in the amazonia or in in java there's in in the democratic republic of congo in the uh, there are primary forests which are um, now every time um, we have less and less surface with the primary forest so that's, that's true, and uh, my opinion is that there should be some sections of, of forests untouched. But let's face it, uh, forests are a source of primary products, and human hands have been on them just because uh, we get resources from them from, from the early ages. Uh, think, for instance, of Central European forests of, or Mediterranean forests. They are absolutely um, um, human, uh, humanly treated, and they will continue being. And in fact, for instance, also in Australia, in Australia, uh, that we think that is a very um, unpopulated, or it was very unpopulated until Europeans reached out there, yet uh, even Aborigines uh, um, managed the, fo the forest. Even the fire, the fire sequences, was a natural way of managing uh, forests. So uh, we need to, to, to live together with those environments and be respectful towards them and manage them in a respectful way. But if you have a forest that is not managed at all, uh, you have lots of um, a high percentage that that forest will burn down by itself as well. So all, all, all the goodness of it, uh, all the resources will be burned down. Okay, thank you. Um, so, ne so next question comes from Javier and is directed towards you, Julia. Okay. Uh, what methods do you use for habitat classification? And do you use any spectral catalog? Which? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, yes, uh, we've been looking and comparing different methods from di different schools. And so we have uh, at GMB, we are integrators, right? Uh, and, and we have published it. So I could all, later on, if you write to me, I, I can give you also the, um, the different publications that we have come up uh, with. So it's not only that we just stick to, to one method. Uh, we put uh, different, even different statistical packs that we have um, we have analyzed like the frac stats. They are they are commonly used in the in the community. But what is true is that uh, oh, the difference that we try to to bring in is that um, we have included parameters or after the classification of patches uh, to include parameters such as discontinuity, distance of discontinuity. Um, infrastructures that fall within the area under study. Uh, we classify how disruptive those infrastructures are and act in the different patches. What else? Um, 
the, yeah, uh, we classify the variety of a species, uh, the density, of course. So with all these, uh, we have come up with um, our own um, partially improved, partially taken from uh, a scholar, already well-known scholar uh, classifications on habitat uh, fragmentation. Perfect. Um, we have uh, another question, the last one. Jerome uh, wants to know uh, to what extent does, clima does climate change threaten the terrestrial ecosystems and the aquatic ecosystems? Okay, <laughs> that's the the big question, the dilemma, yeah. and we have international conferences, as Carlos just mentioned, uh, the, um, the the COP in Paris, the conference of um, Paris. Yeah. So, uh, is there climate change? How severe it is? Uh, does it affect uh, evenly? Does it affect uh, evenly um, on land and oceans and atmosphere? Now. I think that I mean to to come to a, a short uh, a short response to a very complex uh, question is that um, our planet Earth and what surrounds it I mean by uh, at the atmosphere uh, waters etc is a a living planet is a living planet and, and as such uh, it suffers and is in in continuous change and adaptation. And we are in climate change, and, and we know historically that we've, we've run through very dry periods or cold periods or um, hotter periods. So the point is that now uh, we are able to measure it and, and to see the impact on societies and, and how this also affect to, to our economies and to our resilience capac capacity. Uh, so we are in continuous climate change, but we have to do and to live with it and to be aware that we can measure it and, and do lots of um, thoughtful and sensible things so not to exacerbate the consequences of it. Okay, if I may, maybe also, maybe Bea, if you want. Yeah. Also adds to, you know, well, because you have also expertise on this as well. So, uh, yes, on, on political terms. So, over land, of course, I mean, uh, as, as you might all know, the climate change is increasing the precipitation variability and also the probability of extreme dry and wet events. And the long, long term warning, warming is, is in, and, and the, in, the increasing atmospheric uh, water deficits. Of course, are, are increasing the hydrological, hydrological stress uh, of the and, and the ecosystems flammability, so leading to more wildfires. So this is of course, one of the most obvious um, impacts on the on the on land on on coastals. I think the one of the most uh, well known. You can have, you have to distinguish between the rapid and the slow events in the slow and events um, on coastals. You, you you have the this, the coastal erosion, so the the shoreline retreat. This is one of the things that are affecting most of the uh, the urban areas in the in in the coastal regions, and is one of the things that we at GMV also look at. And we have been working with um, with the World Bank in places like Monrovia in order to assess this this kind of effects, assessing not only the coastal erosion but also the subsidence in order to see well to analyze um, to project into the future the places the areas that are um, likely to be flooded because of the of these two effects combined of this um, the um, soil and retreat that is indeed being affected by the sea level rise and the subsidence of the place so all these combination of things that are of course um, part of the climate change effects are affecting the those urban areas and has to be taken into account just to mention a few yeah if you want also you can also add to this yeah, exactly. Like I fully like agree, and is that um, by having that rise in, in temperature that then can promote like a bit more extremes, uh, like floods, droughts, and everything in between of other hazards. They having more frequency of those extreme events, also affecting uh, areas where before they typically they were not affecting. 
is that well, it's increasing potentially like the, the, the overall risk um, because the population is increasing and when you put all the different parts of the, the risk equation together we have more uh, has, the hazard uh, is increasing and perhaps more the, the vulnerability of, of the population living on those areas then uh, it is clear. The good thing is with a lot of different uh, tools and models and, and data we can now like uh, do more early warning for those events uh, which is one key that I think is uh, really value even if uh, those these satellite data sets it can initially can be costly or, or models to set up the, the social economic uh, and, and social benefits are really clear and I think now where all the you know all the conventions and the European uh, laws and international laws they're trying to get to an agreement to actually reduce uh, some of these uh, potential uh, impacts and get more like kind of uh, climate neutral. Yeah, uh, Tatiana, I would like to to conclude this this question just uh, providing yeah. an, another very um, graphic sample that brings together climate change towards a warmer and hotter period, uh, satellites and forests. And it is the fact that now uh, we are able to process something like 40, yeah, 40 years, 40, 45 years of satellite data, of, of observations. And what is evident is that uh, forests grow uh, at a much northern latitude, let's say mm -hmm. in the tundra. Uh, what in areas um, where before we only had some lichens and very uh, shallow and we, we did not have trees. Uh, now we have them 40 years later, which is the evidence that the um, isotherm of 10 degrees, which is key for tree growth, is moving up north more towards the poles. And for that reason, we we are also increasing the the area of trees, and and we can see that very easily through the multi-temporal satellite series. Mm -hmm. Very useful. Uh, well, it's happy day. We have run out of time. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank uh, our colleague uh, Julia, Carlos, and Beatriz and uh, all the attendants for taking time out and being here today. Um, we hope you enjoy our webinar. Um, you can reach us um, as shows in the screen on this email address. And also you can contact us uh, at marketing at gmb.com with any comment or further uh, questions. Um, well, we look forward to seeing you on the next GMB webinar. Thank you again and have a nice afternoon. Bye.